We're still looking at vector spaces and some examples of real vector spaces. Let's look at functions. We've now looked at R3. We've looked at matrices. Let us look at functions. If I've got all real valued functions defined on the interval on all real numbers and vector addition and scalar multiplication is defined as traditional standard way to add two functions and to multiply a function with a scalar. We've had a lot of work on functions, so standard definitions. Then this set is also a vector space. The zero vector will just be the function f of x equal to zero, the zero function. The negative of a function will just be as we understand the negative of a function to be. So we've worked a lot of functions, so all the axioms you can check these functions will, or the set of functions with standard operations will be a vector space. All right, now here's one that looks a little bit differently. Let's look at ordered pairs. I've got a set of ordered pairs with a certain condition. Addition of scalar multiplication is defined in the standard way. So that's standard as we add and multiply two ordered pairs or multiply ordered pair with a scalar, that's standard. But there's something special about this set. It's not all ordered pairs, it's all ordered pairs that looks like this. So for any real numbers A and B, I've got AX plus BY equal to zero, where A and B are any real numbers. So that's what we've got. So let's just look at how what the standard definition of addition of scalar multiplication will be. So if I let U, V, and W be elements of V, where U is equal to, oh, let's call it X1, Y1. V is equal to X2, Y2. And W is equal to X3, Y3. And then we know from here that for any A and B, AX1 plus BY1 gives me zero. AX2 plus BY2 will give me zero. And AX3 plus BY3 will give me zero for A and B real numbers. All right, so that is what my elements of the set look like. Also, let, I'm going to use, choose K, L, and M be my scalars. I'm not necessarily going to use all of them, but that's how we set it up before we prove it. Now, like I said in the first video, it's very tedious to go through all 10 axioms, but I am going to just look at some of them and just take a get a feeling for what we've got going here. My first thing is, is the set closed under addition? So if I've got u plus v, will I end up Oh, we haven't looked at what the addition looks like. Let's just mention that. Standard addition, so that means you add the component x1 plus x2, y1 plus y2. So that's the standard addition. So my question is, is this again back in the set V? Meaning, do I have an ordered pair? Yes, I've got that. Will this condition hold for my ordered pair? Well, let's look at it. So then A times x1 plus x2 plus b times y1 plus y2 gives me ax1 plus ax2 plus by1 plus by2. Well, I already know that ax1 plus by1 gives me 0. ax2 plus by2 gives me 0. So that gives me 0. So therefore, I can see that u plus v is in my set v. So that's how you're going to test all the axioms. You're going to see, does it work? Let's look at my scalar multiplication, my first axiom there. Is it close on the scalar multiplication? So k times u will be k times u1, oh, x1, y1. So that's kx1, ky1. Now is that again in the set V, well, we've got to look. We've got to see what happens if I look at A times KX1 plus B times KY1. What will that give me? Well, it'll give me AKX1 plus BKY1, but I know that's the same as 
take k out and I've got ax1 plus by1, which is just k times 0, which is 0. So we've got it. That one is again. So ku is going to be in my set. So my so the set is closed under vector addition and scalar multiplication. You can go through all the other axioms, but you will see that this forms a vector space. Now, the, the zero vector is just going to be zero, zero. The negative is just going to be minus, minus. But you will have to check, does it fall into the set? So there's a bit of work to do going through all those axioms. But here's another example of a vector space. All right, let's look at this one. Let's say we've got a set of all quadratic polynomials. So polynomials have to be quadratic. So this means they're of this form that's given here, but this A2 is non-zero. A2 can't be zero, quadratic polynomial. So examples, P1 can be 2x squared plus 4x minus 5. P2 can be minus 3x squared plus 7. It doesn't say the middle term can't be zero. So those are examples of quadratic polynomials. That's definitely not an exhaustive list, but that's what we're talking about. So I want to start with quadratic polynomials and end with quadratic polynomials. Addition and scalar multiplication define in the standard way of adding functions and multiplying functions with a scalar. Now, this one is not going to be a vector space. So the question is, how do we figure it out? Now, we need to look at the axioms and see which axioms it doesn't meet. And the nice thing is here, it's the first axiom that it won't meet. Now, I don't have to look at a general case. I can say... Let P1 of X be equal to, let's do the same P1, 2X squared plus 4X minus 5. And let P3, because I've already got a P1 and it'd be 2 let, there, P3, let P3 be minus 2X squared plus 5. Well, then P1X plus P2, 3X, if I add them together, these terms are going to cancel out. I'm going to end up with 4X. 4x is not a quadratic polynomial, so it's not in the set V. So that set is not closed under addition. So I don't even have to look at any other axioms. The first one already crashes out. Some of the others might hold, but it doesn't matter because the first one doesn't hold. So take note, the set is not closed under addition, so it is not a vector space. Now, when will sets of polynomials be vector spaces? We have to get rid of this occurrence that we had in this case. So what we say, I call the set P2. That's all the polynomials of degree less than or equal to 2. Because if we look at the previous example, you're never going to add two quadratic polynomials and get something with a higher degree. You can get something with a lower degree, but not a higher degree. So in general, Pn is the set of all polynomials with degree less than or equal to n. So this set together with the standard addition and standard multiplication is, again, a vector space. All right, now here's one more for this video. Again, a strange definition for addition and multiplication to keep you on your toes. So if my set is all ordered pairs, so R2, all ordered pairs, vector addition is defined in the standard way. Yes, we're just adding the components. But multiplication is not defined in the standard way. Multiplication looks a little bit different. What is going on there? Well, we say you multiply the first component in the ordered pair with k, and the second one becomes zero. This is a bit of a strange definition, but this is how it's defined. So we want to test whether this is a vector space. Now, I can already tell you that the vector addition, all the vector addition axioms, VA1 all the way to VA5, they're going to work. We're happy with that. It's with the scalar multiplication that we're going to have problems. But with the scalar multiplication, the first one's going to work. It's going to be closed because if I multiply a scalar with a vector, I end up being in R2 again. So that's not a problem. And so all of the scalar multiplication ones will work. The only one, and you could go through them step by step, the only one that doesn't work is the last one. When I look at 1 times u, so the fifth scalar multiplication axiom says 1 times u must give me u back. Well, that'll be 1 times u1 and 0, and that's not equal to u. So the last axiom is the only one that doesn't work. But all we need is one not to work, then I do not have a vector space. So that's the vector space 
or that is not a vector space, and we have to find those axioms that do not work. All right, so we're just going to quickly end off with a theorem. We're not going to prove this theorem, but these are some properties of vector spaces. If I've got a vector space, so we've got a vector space, it doesn't matter how addition and multiplication is defined, it is a vector space, then the scalar multiple of 0 times my vector u must end up giving me the 0 vector. Irrespective of how it's defined, this must work. Same with a constant times the 0 vector must give me the 0 vector out. Minus 1, the constant minus 1, the scalar minus 1 times a vector u must give me my minus u that I've defined. And if a scalar times a vector gives me the zero vector, then either the scalar is zero or the vector is the zero vector. So these are properties that must hold for any vector space. In the next series of videos, we're going to be looking at subspaces of vector spaces.